All right, so we're going to start the grand round. So before we uh, start that, I, I just wanted to let you guys know, Dr. Sin Gupta was not available today. So he's asked me to uh, introduce uh, our speaker for today. And uh, so I'm just going to go through uh, just the uh, regular stuff for cardiology grand rounds and that these can be accessed on YouTube. And the link is there on the slide. And also for CME credit, you can text 17015 at 888-816-4893 uh, within 12 hours after the session. And uh, uh, you can uh, text it as a, a SMS message, but not an I message if you're using Apple. And for um, maintenance of certification for MOC points, uh, you can answer a brief quiz at the site, which is there on the slide. And the room code for that is uh, future 38. Let me just open this up. So, Our speaker is um, uh, Dr. Alfonso Waller. Uh, he's the Director of Cardiac Imaging uh, and an Associate Professor of Medicine and Radiology at Rutgers, uh, New Jersey Medical School. He completed uh, his uh, medical school from uh, St. George's University uh, School of Medicine and did his medicine and cardiology fellowship at New Jersey Medical School and completed his Advanced Cardiac Imaging Fellowship at Brigham and Women's Hospital uh, in Boston. And uh, he has uh, published uh, uh, 22 peer-reviewed manuscripts, 21 reviews and editorials, 17 case reports, and multiple book chapters, and uh, has been um, uh, very actively involved uh, in advanced imaging uh, since his training, and uh, is also the program director for advanced cardiac imaging at the program. And um, uh, you know, it's a pleasure to uh, introduce you, uh, Alfonso, and looking forward to hearing your uh, talk. Thank you for that uh, kind introduction. Are you able to see my slides? Yes. OK. So I was asked to talk about something about building the paradigm. So I figured cardiac MRI for cardiomyopathy might fill fit that bill. Um, in terms of disclosures, we have a Pfizer grant for our amyloidosis center here in Newark. Um, I will discuss the off-label use of gadolinium, gadolinium in my presentation. Gadolinium um, for enhanced cardiac MRI is off-label for most FDA-approved gadolinium-based contrast agents, with the exception of Bayer's Gadavis, which is FDA-approved for perfusion and late gadolinium enhancement in patients with known or suspected coronary artery disease. So I know you guys are in New Brunswick, so I wanted to give you a little tour of our campus. This is the campus uh, of New Jersey Medical School and the, the neighboring University Hospital in Newark. Um, the medical school is physically here and adjacent to the hospital. So uh, most of our floors connect uh, and most of the care is, is provided at that main, uh, our principal teaching hospital in Newark. On our campus, cardiology fellows are exposed to advanced echo, nuclear cardiology, PET, cardiac MRI, cardiac CT, and vascular ultrasound. So the good news is we have many advanced non-invasive uh, imaging tools available uh, to image our patients. And often the question becomes, which is the best in terms of imaging our patient? The Bad news is that there's it's becoming increasingly more difficult for clinicians to choose amongst these different uh, imaging techniques, and there's a lot of literature behind each and all of them. So, in the interest of time, I was going to take a Cliff Notes approach to cardiovascular imaging, um, really for the evaluation of cardiomyopathy and the diagnostic targets that cardiac MRI can provide. Now, Cliff Notes is something from the past, uh, uh, possibly. Uh, when I was in high school, th that was a quick way to get through uh, a, a book if you were if you wanted to get a synopsis of it. 
Now things are maybe more, a contemporary approach might be something like a TikTok video or a, sh a short tutorial of, uh, of, of information. So when we were first year medical students, uh, it was very easy to, to look at um, the pathologic findings of a cardiomyopathy. You could have a dilated cardiomyopathy um, or you could have an infiltrative disease and, and look at it in gross specimen. When we talk about cardiomyopathy, this is an older paper from 1984, uh, non-valvular heart disease in the latter part of the 19th century was labeled chronic myocarditis with inflammation that it was only recognized was only recognized to cause heart muscle disease. And then in 1968, the WHO defined cardiomyopathy as conditions of different frequently unknown etiology in which the dominant feature is cardiomegaly and cardiac failure, excluding myocardial dysfunction due to valvular disease, coronary artery disease, or systemic or pulmonary vascular disease. So if we look at the word cardiomyopathy, it's, the, it's defined as myocardial disorders in which the heart muscle is structurally and functionally abnormal in the absence of coronary artery disease hypertension, valvular disease, congenital heart disease, sufficient to explain the observed myocardial findings. The traditional approach when we evaluate patients with heart failure or dyspnea is to get an echocardiogram and evaluate whether or not they have impaired LV function or LV diastolic dysfunction. If we focus on LV function, uh, Often after assessing for uh, impaired LV function, there is a coronary, anat coronary anatomy assessment, either by cath or some form of stress testing. And then the patients get labeled as having an ischemic cardiomyopathy or a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. If we look at the recent heart failure guidelines, the diagnostic algorithm for heart failure or patients with suspected heart failure, again, is the clinical assessment, often then an echo, um, and then heart failure is diagnosed and determined. They're classified based on EF. And if someone has preserved EF, mid-range EF, or reduced EF. And then evaluate for precip precipitating factors. The ATLAS trial was a prospective international multi-center randomized double-blind parallel group study comparing the effects on mortality and mortality plus morbidity in low versus high dose ACE inhibitor. Specifically, it was lisinopril. And they looked at uh, over 3,100 patients with moderate severe heart failure caused by systolic dysfunction, and they had a median follow-up of 41 months. There was 100% complete follow-up data. The primary results showed, showed a trend to decrease mortality in the high dose group. But of this study, about there were 1,383 deaths um, during the follow-up period. Um, and autopsy was performed in 188 patients. Data was available on 171 patients. And of those diagnosed as clinically having an ischemic cardiomyopathy alone, which was 92 patients, or in combination with other diagnoses, only 83% only 83 of the 121 actually had coronary disease at autopsy. Of the 51, that were diagnosed as clinically as not having an ischemic cardiomyopathy, 31 actually, 31 percent actually had coronary disease, um, significant coronary artery disease. So overall, 21 percent had an incorrect clinical diagnosis. Cardiomyopathies could be classified as primary card cardiomyopathies that they're predominantly involving the heart, and those that are highlighted can be easily. Uh, evaluated by cardiac MRI, or they could be secondary cardiomyopathies from under other causes. And again, cardiac MRI could be useful in identifying those causes. This is an updated table from, from the recent heart failure guidelines. Again, looking for other potential causes of non-ischemic causes of heart failure. Now, some might say, well, why is it important to go beyond ischemic versus non-ischemic? When we look at Kaplan-Meier curves of estimated survivals of underlying causes of cardiomyopathy, there's varying degrees of survival depending on the underlying etiology of your cardiomyopathy. This is true when you compare even idiopathic cardiomyopathy with those of cardiomyopathy due to sarcoid or amyloid or hemochromatosis. So 
Some may say, is there an invasive option? Well, right ventricular biopsy usually involves taking a biotome. It's usually from a right IJ approach and a small sample of tissue um, is taken. And if that tissue hap happens to have the diagnosis, you can make the diagnosis. But if you're, if you're dealing with focal disease processes that may not involve the myocardium uniformly, you may end up with normal myocardium and miss the diagnosis. In the more recent heart failure guidelines, this is the classification scale that's used in terms of looking at the strength of recommendations where class one is a strong recommendation and is recommended, 2A is reasonable, 2B may be reasonable or may be considered, and three could be broken down into no benefit or harm. When we talk about endomyocardial biopsy, it may be useful in specific diseases where it would influence therapy, or it's uh, for patients undergoing routine evaluation, obviously endomyocardial biopsy, there's potential for harm and is not recommended. So it should not be performed routinely. So non-invasive option. The diagnostic uh, targets of cardiac MRI are to look at morphology, function, inflammation. We could also look for ion deposition or perfusion and infarct and fibrosis. This is an image of a, of a typical cardiac MRI where we could see a four chamber, three chamber, two chamber and short axis view of the heart, not limited by echocardiographic images you, uh, or body size or body habitus, as long as the patient can fit inside the magnet. These images are obtained without the use of contrast and you can get better delineation of, uh, of the myocardium compared to echo and you can get quantitative information as well. So if you get short axis slices from the base of the heart to the apex, you can get measures of end diastolic and end systolic uh, size. And that be, could provide you quantitative information of, again, myocardial mass, uh, end diastolic volume, end systolic volume, ejection fraction, and other parameters, including stroke volume, cardiac output. That information along with flow uh, information that could be obtained from cardiac MRI can also be used to evaluate valvular heart disease, regardless of whether or not it's primary MR or secondary MR. The top is illustrating a cardiac MRI in somebody with primary MR and using flow data to quantify the MR. And the bottom is someone with that has late gadolinium enhancement and typical distribution of a coronary vessel and has secondary MR from ischemic MR. So other examples where, we're gonna go through some examples where morphology and function could be helpful. In the 2010 uh, revised task force criteria for ARVC, uh, there you could get major or minor criteria from cardiac MRI. So if there's regional wall motion of the RV and uh, a dilated, right ventricular end diastolic volume or a reduced ejection fraction on the right side, you can get a major criteria. There's slightly different numbers that are used for the minor criteria. The diagnostic terminology for the revised criteria uh, gives you a definite diagnosis if you have two major criteria or one major and two minor or four minor from different categories. So cardiac MRI could be useful in terms of providing either a major or a minor um, which could be used in terms of uh, achieving a definite diagnosis of ARVC. Borderline is one major and one minor, or three minors, and possible is one major or two minor from different categories. In 2010, 20, there was an updated ARVC criteria, the Padua criteria. The left column represents an upgrade of the 2010 diagnostic criteria that we just talked about. Um, while those on the right side of the screen gives a new categories for left-sided ARVC. The novelty of the ARVC guidelines from 2020 is that the introduction of tissue characterization by delayed enhancement for the detection of fibro fatty myocardial replacement of either ventricle. So again, you could have major criteria or minor criteria. And I'm, I, this part is the minor criteria for the right side but very similar. 
So this is an example of a cardiac MRI of a patient with ARVD where we have a dyskinetic free wall of the RV. Another area that where cardiac MRI could be useful is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is a delayed enhancement image where there's mid-myocardial late gadolinium enhancement. Another patient with uh, mid-wall late gadolinium enhancement as well as myocardial CRIPS. So in 2011, the, there were guidelines on the diagnosis and treatment of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. In 2011, the, the recommendations looked slightly different where the class one, again, should be done, um, is recommended. Class 2A is reasonable. Class 2B may be considered. Class 3 were grouped together, the no benefit and no harm. And in the 2011 guidelines, CMR is indicated in patients with suspected HCM when echo is inconclusive for diagnosis. CMR is also indicated in patients with known HCM when additional information may impact the management or decision regarding invasive management, such as magnitude and distribution of hypertrophy and anatomy of the mitral valve apparatus when not adequately defined by echo. Uh, it's a two-way and reasonable in patients with HCM to define apical hypertrophy and or aneurysm if echo is inconclusive and to be um, when risk stratification is inconclusive ap after documentation of conventional risk factors. CMR could be used in terms of looking for late gadolinium enhancement um, in resolving clinical decision-making. In terms of sudden cardiac death risk stratification, maximal LV wall thickness is something that we be often better, better visualize with cardiac MRI because of the better delineation of walls. Um, and it could be useful in sudden cardiac death risk factor modifiers um, in selected patients with HCM for whom the risk uh, remains borderline after looking at conventional uh, risk factors. So in this example, there's late gadolinium enhancement in the mid wall of this patient and the, the wall thickness is increased for this patient. The more updated 2020 guidelines on the diagnosis and treatment of HCM have the more updated uh, uh, recommendations like what we saw before in the heart failure guidelines, so I'm not going to go through these. But again, in, for patients with LVH in whom there's suspicion for alternative diagnosis, including infiltrative or storage diseases, as well as athlete, athlete's heart, CMR could be useful, and that's a class one recommendation. And in patients with HCM who are not otherwise identified as high risk for sudden cardiac death, or in whom a decision to, to proceed with an implantable uh, ICD remains uncertain, it, it would be a class one recommendation to, to proceed with a cardiac MRI. So now if we move on to T2. So T2 imaging is helpful in acute presentations of dilated cardiomyopathy. While T2 weighted imaging is, um, it could look for areas of increased uh, water content or active inflammation or edema. In this example right here, these are short axis slices through the ventricle. The areas of, of brightness, which I'll highlight with red arrows, um, show increased mid-wall subepicardial signal on T2-weighted imaging uh, in the antilateral wall, suggesting that this patient had acute uh, myocarditis. So if things are involving the innermost layer, the endocardium, it could be due to coronary disease, but in other areas, it could be due to under an active inflammatory process. So iron deposition. Beta, beta thalassemia major is a genetic disorder which affects about 60,000 newborns per year worldwide. Uh, mutations in the globulin, beta globulin gene can lead to progressive chronic anemia. Affected individuals tend to be dependent on lifelong repeated blood transfusions where they have increased total body iron from transfusions and increased absorption from the gut stimulated by the anemia itself. But the, the body has no real effective mechanism for removing excess iron, and iron could accumulate in the spleen, liver, bone, marrow, <clears throat> pancreas, endocrine organs, and the heart. Um, it may lead to impaired organ function, and the development of heart failure may be unpredictable and rapid. The, as iron accumulates, 
with little effect on function until storage capacity has been ex ex exceeded, there is what's thought to be a critical threshold and systolic dysfunction is often a, a late sign of toxicity. When one looks at a, um, the function of a patient with iron overload, their overall uh, heart function might look like an idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy indistinct from other cardiomyopathies. The goal obviously would be to identify patients earlier so that you, they could uh, initiate intensive chelation prior to the onset of systolic dysfunction and avoid morbidity and mortality from overt heart failure. Uh, iron quantification, a variety of approaches have been used, serum ferritin, which could be influenced obviously by other factors. Liver biopsy is invasive. There could be sampling errors. And there's often dissociation between liver and myocardial iron accumulation. A myocardial biopsy is invasive, which, um, and it also could have sampling errors because iron tends to be increased in sub-epicardial layers. So T2 is a uh, T2 star relaxation time constant that indicates how fast the MRI signal decays. So iron deposits in tissue become magnetized in the scanner, inducing local irregularities in the mag magnetic field and can cause nearby water protons to lose phase coherence more rapidly. The effect is concentration dependent, so higher levels of iron could lead to uh, faster times. So more iron, greater, greater magnetic field in the homogeneity, faster signal decay, shorter T2 star. T2 star varies reciprocally with, iron, with tissue iron concentration, and it could be used in any tissue. So we can measure uh, the T2 star of liver, T2 star of heart. This is uh, just an example of quantification by T2 star, showing how the myocardium is getting dark over time. Just to compare, the images on the left is a normal heart, and the images on the right of the screen are those with increased iron. We could set regions of interest over the myocardium and look at the, the, the T2 star of low iron versus high iron and quantify that, uh, which can be done readily at the scanner or, or using post-processing software. So the next part, we're gonna go through perfusion. So components of a cardiac MRI study, first we get localizers to find where the heart is in relation um, with, with the patient inside the scanner. You could do T2 um, imaging to look for increased water content or edema. T2 star looking for iron overload. You can perform a stress test giving a vasodilator and that do perfusion imaging in terms of seeing how the myocardium actually perfuses while under stress or at rest, get assessment of regional function, and then do delayed enhancement. A typical MRI study could take be about 45 minutes. There are two phases of myocardial enhancement following contrast administration. Um, initially, with injection, there is first pass perfusion. During the first pass, contrast makes it through the circulation and myocardial enhancement is caused by T1 shortening. So first you, on the, the lower part of the screen, you see contrast entering the right atrium, right ventricle, going to the lungs, left atrium, left ventricle, out the aorta, then into the actual myocardium. So this could be used at rest to look at rest perfusion or during stress, you could look to see if there's an area of the myocardium that's not getting uh, as much flow relative to the rest of the myocardium. After about five minutes, gadolinium reaches a steady state. Gadolinium is an extracellular-based contrast agent. So what that means is in no areas of normal tissue, there'll be very low levels of gadolinium, but any area of cell damage or scar, there'll be higher concentrations of, of contrast. So this illustration shows on the left side of the screen, normal intact cells, there'll be very low gadolinium present. If there was an acute myocardial infarction or cell damage, there would be increased um, there would be increased areas or in increased concentrations of gadolinium. Or if there was scar where the cells are right not, not next to each other, but there's collagen matrix, there would be higher levels levels of gadolinium in that area. So that can be used in terms of viability assessment 
So this is an example of, of a, a, a myocardium. This black area is viable, normal myocardium. The areas of white is infarcted. Coronary arteries are epicardial, so they're on the outer layer of the, of, of the heart. And the area that's most impacted from um, infarcts is the innermost layer of the heart. So this is a typical infarct in the typical distribution of the left anterior descending artery that's involving the anterior septum and the anterior wall. And when we compare MRI to SPECT, uh, this is a dog model. Um, the, they, these, these dogs first got uh, SPECT images and you, then they ended up getting MRIs and then euthanized. And you could see that delayed enhancement uh, correlated with the pathology better than traditional SPECT. Delayed enhancement for viability is not a new thing. This is a publication from 2000 uh, showing that uh, delayed enhancement can be used to identify coronary territories. Uh, so the black area, again, is normal, and the white area is an area of, in, uh, of prior infarct. This is an example of an LED infarct, a circumflex, and a right coronary artery. We can look at the transmural extent of that delayed enhancement. So again, it's involving first the innermost layer, but can, can be transmural if it's a transmural infarct. The transmural extent can correlate with likelihood of improved contractility. Um, so it could be used in terms of viability assessment. Um, cardiac MRI could also be helpful in terms of prognosis and dilated cardiomyopathies. So on the top, we see a patient without late gadolinium enhancement shown in um, A and B, and in C and D, we have a patient that has mid-wall late gadolinium enhancement. So different than what we saw with coronary disease, coronary disease would be the innermost layer um, as opposed to uh, mid-wall enhancement, which would be a non-coronary territory. So to review, an ischemic cardiomyopathy would, would have a subendocardial or innermost layer uh, late gadolinium enhancement or, or could have a transmural uh, infarct while non-ischemic patterns have been described, um, classically, sarcoid is a great example where you could have focal disease processes anywhere. It could be uh, mid-wall, it could be epicardial. And there are patterns that have been described for dis different disease processes. When we, when we look at Kaplan-Meier curves, uh, the the survival estimates for um, looking at all-cause mortality or hospitalizations due to cardiovascular causes, uh, late gadolinium enhancement, they have a lower event-free survival compared to those without late gadolinium enhancement. And this is true even when adjustment, adjusting for other factors, including left ventricular ejection fraction. There are some reports that cardiac MRI could be helpful in terms of determination of different types of, of cardiac uh, amyloidosis. It's not our, necessarily our first go-to um, when there are other tests available. But both AL um, and ATTR at the time of this publication, the, the cumulative survival were both poor, but identifying those patients could be helpful. So for AL, obviously treatment being chemotherapy and for ATTR being newer therapies. So this is a case of a 47-year-old male who presented with complete heart block. This is the delayed enhancement images. And in this image, you could see areas of subepicardial late gadolinium enhancement. The detection of Delayed enhancement um, for, cardi for cardiac sarcoidosis is not something new. This is something from um, 2009, where 81 patients with biopsy-proven uh, extra cardiac sarcoid, um, 21 patients had delayed enhancement, and um, only 10 patients had um, positive clinical criteria, which led to the suggestion that delayed enhancement was more than twice as sensitive for cardiac involvement at as clinical criteria at the time. And this has been shown in subsequent studies where myocardial um, damage detected by delayed enhancement uh, appears to be associated with future adverse events, including cardiac death, um, compared to those without um, delayed enhancement. Sarcoidosis specifically, 
um, could have non-coronary disease patterns, but into in up to 14% of patients, they have a coronary disease pattern. So you should exclude the presence of coronary artery disease uh, prior uh, to evaluating for um, sarcoidosis. A subsequent study looked at 155 patients with systemic uh, sarcoidosis. 39 had late gadolinium enhancement and 12 experienced death or aborted sudden cardiac death. Um, 11 of the 12 events were in patients that had late gadolinium enhancement. The follow-up for this uh, study was 2.6 years. Um, one patient who ended up dying, ended up dying from a pulmonary infection um, and he did not have late gadolinium enhancement. So late gadolinium enhancement has been shown to have um, more events and aborted sudden cardiac death than those with without late gadolinium enhancement. So the advantages of CMR is that uh, it could display myocardial uh, late gadolinium enhancement, enhancement in regions of fibrosis or edema, and T2 weight imaging may may identify areas of increased edema or um, uh, increased water content. So this is that that 47 year old that complete that presented with complete heart block. When we look at the 2013 um, ACC AHA guidelines for the management of heart failure, non-invasive imaging to detect myocardial ischemia or viability is reasonable in patients with heart failure. Viability assessment is reasonable before revascularization in patients with CAD, and MRI could be useful to assess LVEF and volume. MRI is reasonable when assessing myocardial uh, infiltration or scar. Those were all 2A recommendations. In 2016, CMR by the ESC guidelines could be recommended for the assessment of myocardial structure and function in subjects with poor acoustic windows or with complex congenital heart disease. CMR with late gadolinium enhancement should be considered in patients with dilated cardiomyopathies in order to distinguish between ischemic and non-ischemic myocardial damage in cases of equivocal clinical uh, in, in, in cases of equivocal clinical or other imaging data. And CMR is recommended for characterization of myocardial tissue in cases of suspected myocarditis, amyloid, sarcoid, Chagas, Fabre's. Um, disease, non-compaction cardiomyopathy, and hemochromatosis. And it could, could be considered for assessment of myocardial ischemia and viability in patients with heart failure and coronary artery disease before decisions of revascularization. When we look at the, the, the recent heart failure guidelines, it's a class one recommendation for whom echo is inadequate. So you could pursue alternative imaging, such as cardiac MRI, cardiac CT, or, or, or nuclear for the assessment of LVEF. It's also a 2A in, in patients with heart failure or cardiomyopathy. It could be useful in terms of diagnosis or management. And 2B, in patients with heart failure and coronary artery disease who are candidates for coronary vascularization, non-invasive stress testing um, may be considered for detection of myocardial ischemia to help guide coronary vascularization. So here's another case. So on the top row is stress perfusion, and the bottom row is rest perfusion. Um, during stress perfusion, with contrast, the myocardium should be enhancing uniformly. And what we see in this image is we see an area of darkness where there's less perfusion to that territory. This patient was a 51-year-old female. She presented with palpitations and chest pressure. She had a history of scleroderma. Um, has hyperlipidemia and hypertension. She had EKG changes um, in V2 to V6 that were old. So she underwent a cardiac MRI. Her overall function was normal. This is the T2 and there was no late gadolinium enhancement. And the patient ended up having an area of focal disease in the circumflex that was fixed by stenting. There's another case of 51-year-old female who presented with chest pain, nausea, and diaphoresis for several hours, has a past medical history of hypertension and hyperlipidemia, had a normal electrocardiogram, and on day one had elevated troponins and elevated CK. 
and went on for an invasive angiography. This is a, a shot of the left system and we see a normal left circumflex, normal LAD. Here's another view of the LAD. And an image of the right coronary artery that was also interpreted as normal. The patient then went in on for a cardiac MRI. These are the two T2 weighted images where you could see that there's increased brightness along the infralateral wall. Perfusion was done at rest without stress. The overall heart function was normal. And these are short axis images that were done post contrast. On the short axis lake at aluminum enhancement images, we see an area of lake at aluminum enhancement along the basal and mid infralateral segments that we see on the long axis. So this patient was diagnosed as having had an infarct in, in the typical distribution of the left circumflex. This is another case of an 18 year old man with no, no previous cardiac history who presented with severe chest pain. The troponin T was up to 79. And this patient had a cardiac MRI that showed lake adalimum enhancement in a non coronary distribution involving the epicardium. Um, and this patient was diagnosed with having acute myocarditis. Other sequences that can be performed, including um, having using what's called the long TI that helps us ident identify areas of clot. Um, so one of the things, one of the other advantages of cardiac MRI is looking for masses. In terms of cardiac MRI, uh, the most of the sequences that we went over um, can help identify a number of, of cardiomyopathies. Because of the limited time, I did not include uh, parametric mapping techniques, which also provide a non-invasive tool for quantifying tissue alterations of myocardial disease. Uh, this includes visualizing and quantifying changes in myocardial composition based on changes in T1, T2, and T2 uh, star relaxation times and ECV, which is uh, extracellular volume. So you could identify iron overload, amyloid, uh, um, fibrase, and myocarditis. Those are clinical scenarios where cardiac mapping um, provides unique information and could be, could be applied to guide clinical care. Again, in the interest of time, I also didn't really go into cardiac masses. Um, so cardiac masses can be looked at with different um, sequences to see the different characterizations of that those masses um, to, to really characterize and determine if it's a benign tumor or a malignant tumor and what exactly it, it is. Um, so in the interest of time, again, I didn't have time to go through that. So if we go through the modified approach where patients with dyslexia and heart failure get an echo, we identify them as having uh, LV, LV, uh, impaired LV function. Something that could be considered is uh, instead of a, a regular uh, stress nuclear or stress echo, stress MRI, something that could be looked at in terms of getting, uh, identifying somebody as being ischemic or non-ischemic. If you still do a, a stress or a cath and if myocardial disease is suspected, then a cardiac MRI could be useful. So if we look at the appropriate use criteria, if in the initial evaluation of known or suspected heart failure based on signs um, or abnormal tests, um, to assess systolic and diastolic function and looking for a possible etiology, cardiac MRI could be appropriate. If you have a suspected, inherited, or acquired cardiomyopathy, it could be appropriate. And if you suspect pericardial disease or cardiac masses or acute aortic pathology, including acute aortic syndromes, it may be appropriate. Other additional CMR appropriateness might be looking at left ventricular systolic dysfunction in the absence of severe valvular disease, uh, pulmonary hypertension in the absence of severe valvular disease, excluding CAD in patients with heart failure and LV dysfunction without angina. And if you wanted to further evaluate for an undefined cardiomyopathy, 
or if you're suspecting cardiac sarcoid, cardiac amyloidosis, or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So with that, I'll end and see if there's any questions. Uh, Alfonso, thank you very much. It was an excellent overview and uh, uh, a great talk. A couple of uh, quick questions, then I'll open it up for um, uh, you know, questions for everyone, from everyone. So first, uh, you know, it's a very underutilized, I think, MRI, especially for heart failure patients. We need to do more MRIs for cardiac MRIs, and that helps a lot with diagnosis and also even in ischemic patients to decide whether there's significant viability or not. And also for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, deciding whether they uh, need a device or not. Uh, looking at that criteria is also helpful, looking at the apical aneurysm or if the scar is greater than 15% or if the wall thickness is greater than 30 millimeter or also the EF if that's uh, greater than 50% or not. So all these things help for all hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients. But like you mentioned for the stress testing, I think for stress testing uh, with the um, uh, MR, the other benefit is uh, flow reserve. So do you guys do flow reserves with MR? So that's a good question. So we don't. Um, and, you know, when you talk about flow reserves, you know, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir in terms of saying that, you know, if you have a pet program, uh, you know, pet uh, is easily accessible, available and and um is great but yeah we don't um clinically do uh flow reserve for stress mri and as you know um stress pet is 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 more utilized for for flow reserve clinically yeah. So yeah. places who have a pet scan absolutely a pet would be a better choice but the places who do not have a PET program, I think the other alternative is to do a stress MR to get flow reserves non-invasive. Yep. The, the other, uh, one more uh, question, Fonzo, do you do some serial uh, MRI imaging, especially for your amyloid patients, uh, to look for uh, you know, progression or regression of their disease? No, oh, that's a good question. Um, so we, for us, uh, MRI is not our first line in terms of for amyloid. Um, oftentimes, you know, we're starting with an echo and with the clinically suspected with echo, we're then doing um, blood work uh, as well as PYP imaging. So it's not our, it's not at all our first line um, for amyloid specifically. Um, you know, but then if, if, if patients do get an MRI um, because it's suspected, um, then, then we still follow then our, our algorithm of going with blood work and and PYP imaging. But, so both, with some, both great know, questions. New, right. So the new uh, data with looking at ECV and following up these patients with ECV, especially the data we just coming out from London from National Amyloid Center from Gilmore's book. Uh, they have shown that it's uh, very helpful. So I think that's something which. Uh, might be helpful in um, uh, looking at the progression or regression of disease. I'm going to open it up for questions. If anyone in the audience has any questions or if you want to write it up or just you know uh, ask any questions from Alfonso. Uh, this is uh, AJ Shah. Yeah, well, in a great talk. Thanks for the, you know, I know it's tough and you really covered uh, so much uh, and a wonderful overview. <clears throat> now, um, did you mention that uh, uh, the CMR can differentiate between the AL and the ATTR? So there's there's one report uh, that claims to differentiate the type. Um, I would say with amyloidosis, it's one, usually the, the one disease that's one of the toughest in terms of uh, evaluating by CMR. Um, because it's a systemic disease where there's expansion of the extracellular space throughout the body. Um, so uh, it, gadolinium, which, which is an extracellular-based contrast agent, gets into wherever the amyloid deposits are. So it often becomes challenging um, and almost 
diagnostic that it's hard to find what's called an inversion time for those patients. Um, there are other techniques, which I didn't go over, that Dr. Bakari was mentioning in terms of looking at ECV and um, T1 mapping or native T1 mapping. Um, those may be promising in terms of being able to differentiate, but right now, it's, we're not relying on cardiac MRI to differentiate and more often using PYP imaging, um, which Dr. Bakari is a, is, has published about and is an expert in, uh, to really differentiate uh, ATTR versus AL, along with biomarkers and, uh, and you know. In this case, I don't know, Dr. Bakari, if you have anything to add to that. Right, so for MRI, uh... This is not used for differentiating, like Alfonso said, for uh, uh, AL and TTR, uh, because uh, the image would be almost similar in that uh, when you're looking at AL or TTR. Uh, for differentiating between these two uh, would be basically uh, doing your uh, PYP. It's also not 100% uh, diagnostic test between AL and TTR. The only way we would do that is by looking at immunofixation and free light chain assays. And if those are negative and PYP is positive, then we would say, okay, it's suggestive of TTR amyloidosis. Same thing is with MRI. Uh, if you're doing your immunofixation and free light chain assays, and those are negative, and MRI picture looks, uh, uh, and the MRI picture looks like amyloid, then you would say that it's TTR amyloid, not AL amyloid. And there, there's only one uh, country which uses this criteria, and that's Germany, which uh, are using MRI as one of their algorithms in diagnosing um, uh, amyloidosis without PYP or without biopsy. So you can do it, but you have to rule it out AL by immunofixation first. Yep, completely agree. No, great. No, thank you. That was a very good. One more question I had in cases of uh, myocarditis. Um, you know, you know. Obviously, once they are admitted with acute, you know, episode, do you then follow them with uh, MRI um, in terms of looking at the, as you mentioned, the edema, inflammation. Yeah, so I'll use I'll use sarcoid for an example as an example for that. Often sarcoid is used for uh, identifying areas uh, of uh, MRI is often is first in terms of looking for areas of inflammation and looking for areas uh, of sarcoidosis. But oftentimes in those types of patients, we end up uh, doing FTG PET in terms of that baseline and then follow up in therapy to look for. Uh, um, areas of, of inflammation. Now, sarcoidosis is a disease where you get repeated episodes of inflammation. As opposed to myocarditis, often we think that um, they may have an initial insult of myocarditis, and then that should could go away. There have been some, some studies on myocarditis in terms of looking at subsequent scans um, in cancer patients in terms of uh, immunotherapy-related uh, myocarditis. That's something that's been done. Um, in terms of the actual uh, an acute myocarditis that's suspected to be a viral illness, often um, they'll get an MRI in terms of diagnosis and maybe a follow-up echo. If the EF is, is resolved and improved, there may not be a need to do a subsequent MRI. Great. Thank you so much. Any other questions from anyone? Alfonso, one more question I can ask you is uh, for your sarcoid patients, for initial diagnosis, do you do MRI and PET both and then follow them up for, with serial PETs to see if they are responding to treatment or not? So often we, that's a good question. Often we do um, get an MRI. Our MRI is usually our first go-to. Um, we often find it challenging to get uh, approvals for um, FDG PET. We, we have, in cases where we um, have been able to, it, it has been helpful in terms of seeing what the uh, inflammation is at baseline and then being able to monitor response to therapy. So in certain cases, we have used it. 
for that. Um, but often it may not be possible to get the FDG PET approved for sarcoid. And we end up following with the with MRI. Uh, but I, in, in terms of inflammation, I think uh, FDG PET is superior to 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 regular T2 imaging. Yeah, no, absolutely. The only thing is with FDG PET, sometimes uh, specificity is low because of myocardial uptake. Yeah. So combining it with MRI uh, makes your specificity higher. So you yep. don't have that many false positives. So thank you very much, Alfonso. It was an excellent uh, talk. And um, uh, so if, if there are no more questions, then we will end the grand dance. All right. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye-bye.